and he was also worldwide director and here's the emphasis the worldwide director research and development and subsequently director of market development at Beckton Dickinson and Co the world's largest manufacturer of injection systems viewers professor Fred McBangalori holds an MBA from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology MIT a Sloan fellow and earned a PhD in materials engineering from the University of Dayton, Dayton, and Masters in Engineering Science and Mechanics from Virginia Tech, Blacksburg, in Virginia, the USA. A bachelor's of that's a bachelor of science in manufacturing engineering, and this is summer cum laude from Central State University, Wilberforce. Additionally, he was a visiting scholar and research associate at the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics and then also a School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton University, respectively. Our guest this evening and our captain for the month of November is a recipient of the 2008 U.S. Black Engineer of the Year, Most Promising Scientist Award 2008, NJ Biz Innovator Hero uh, Award, and was 2009 finalist of the NASA Astronaut Candidate Cups, that's ASCON. Professor Fred McBanglory was a member of the Technical Committee under the auspices of Honorable Professor Fred Pomboating, Minister for Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, that developed the new Ghana Science, Technology and Innovation Policy. See, viewers, I can go on and on and on. I'm trying my best to summarize the profile, but I don't know what to take out. Prof, it's good to have you. We Thank celebrate you. you. Thank you. And uh, you are captain for the month of November. I'm privileged. Thank you. And we are happy to have you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank and you. and uh, I've just been reading through this profile as many times as I got it over the weekend. And great. Congratulations to you for you. all the stuff and the great things that you've achieved, not only for yourself, but for and in the name of the Republic of Ghana. Absolutely. You know, because everything I'm reading right now, everywhere you are mentioned and all the achievements, it goes with the fact that you are Ghanaian. Absolutely. And that's what really I admire about all the feats that we have been mentioning so far. But beyond this profile, who is Professor Fred McBagonluri? Uh, Professor Fred McBagonluri is a, a Ghanaian born and bred, um, lucky enough to have everything you've listed. And sometimes when I hear these things, I try to pinch myself. Um, raised by my grandparents in East Legon, who never had any formal education, mm. um, inculcated in us a sense of justice, a sense of fairness. Um, and those are the principles that I live by, that society is only stable and peaceful when we stand up for the weakest among us. Mm. And that's what I live with, that's what I stand by. Um, I was about um, one of 15 students who mm. went on head of state scholarship to the United States. And I'm happy to report I'm the only one that came back. You're the only one that came back? Absolutely. Oh, the other 14 disappeared? Maybe one day. <laughs> they're still in preparation. <laughs> it takes a while, but I, you know, I think with time. Mm -hmm. So I am very committed uh, to the process of national development mm. in, and in whatever capacity I can offer. But I think the best place to start from is in the classroom, to bring Absolutely. some of these experiences from industry um, and, and to merge this seamlessly into the tertiary educational sector. And that is what we seem to be doing at Academic City College. You know, mm -hmm. We are bringing both worlds together because in the world where we don't really have those major industries where students can go out and get real practical experience, you have to bring that, that experience home to them. So we focus on experiential learning, which means you have to touch, you have to feel. Mm. You have to understand the relevance of whatever you are studying within the context of the African environment. Um, we have to teach you to be lifelong learners. So we have a pillar that we call extensional learning because we can't teach you everything in four years. Yeah. But can we tool you sufficiently so that you can go out there and use that kit to advance society? And then what we also do that is quite unique is we have a pillar we call unified learning. Mm. which means at the end of every semester we bring students from across disciplines and put them into groups and then they work on a common project. The wow. philosophy is that that is really how the real life 
Mm. You give them the real life experience exactly. in, in school so they are not yeah. taken by surprise when they, when, when they are hit with Absolutely. the world of work. Right. And we'll get to that disconnect okay. as we go on. But okay. you are someone who was born in Legon and yeah. you ended up in Wa. Yeah. <laughs> I want to reconcile the two. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two, two separate worlds. Separate uh, worlds. Uh, yes. How did they happen? Yes. So my, my father. I mean, both parents are from Upper West. Mm. My grandparents lived in Legon from the 50s. And so I grew up with them. And then when my grandfather passed, there was a need for us to go back and experience what home is. Mm. So we were sent back to the north, my older brother and myself. I see. To go learn to speak the language and to get some cultural training. Um, my parents actually met, met in East Legon. You know, my dad was a an MPP, UP foot soldier, oh, right. uh, who, with Alaji Mohamed Drisu, were actually delivering messages to Bechabi Lante when he was in <laughs> hiding. I mean, that's how my parents met, literally. Um, and so long tradition, my father's uncle was Kelio Jato, who was mm. Minister for Transport and Communication. Right. And if you know the East Legon Baleshi area in the Absolutely. 60s, it was a very active political hotbed. True, it still is. <laughs> Within the Iowa so West Wagon constituency. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it still is. I mean, it's, it's, it's lived uh, with the history that, that backs it. Exactly. So that's how you ended up in Wa. That's how I ended up in Wa. In, in the Nandong Secondary School. Yeah, I went to Nandong Secondary so School. So it was a deliberate decision by your parents to take you back home. Absolutely. And go and learn the language. Learn the language, understand where they come from, um, you know, define my own perspectives about life, and, and more importantly, have a reference point. Hmm. Because a man... It's like a tree. You need, to, you need your roots. True. Have a reference point. Yeah. Is this something that you, you would repeat or have your children also go through that same experience? I mean, I, I ask this because there, <laughs> there are a lot of people who are growing up in Accra who have no idea about where they come from. Yeah. You know, that's a very interesting question. I've never thought about it. I think what I really miss is my kids going to the boarding school system, mm. no matter where it is, because I went to Nandom and I went to St. Augustine's College. Yeah. And I thought when I left home as a 19-year-old in America, I was self-sufficient. I was well-prepared. I've been away from home half my life. Wow. And so I was, I was a fighter, you know. Mm. Um, and, and I don't think they have that. You know, my, mm. when I attempted to put my little daughter into boarding school, Christian High, she called a family meeting one day and she said that my friends told me that uh, parents that send their kids to boarding school don't love them enough. Yeah. And that's how she succeeded in jumping out of it. But I think it's a unique experience. Mm. I wish that they would. Um, I've tried to take them home to the north anytime they were there. They are, they are here, mm. you know. And I remembered a couple of years ago, I was driving my daughter through Nadoli. And she said, Dad, can I ask you a personal question? I said, sure. What the hell are we doing here? <laughs> Why bring us to this? Why? It's 12 hours all the way into these bushes, she said. So I looked at her and I said, Daughter, do you mm. understand something? 65% of your genes belongs to people that once roam on this terrain. Wow. That I am so proud of and I think you should know that. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And, and, and you know, well, that kind of experience tends to bring them to a certain sense of reality yeah. and, and a sense of understanding yeah. of, of where they are. And I think that yeah. this is something that, I mean, I ask this because of, you know, where we find ourselves now and the fact that a, a lot of parents are caught in this kind yes. of situation. They're okay. disjointed. The kids are disjointed mm -hmm. and disoriented. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they obviously have no history of where they even come from. And you ended up in St. Augustine's. Yes. Absu Absu Absolutely, you're full-blooded. Full-blooded. <laughs> How did that happen? Well, so, interesting enough, um, Presec and St. Augustine's were competing for sit form. I see. And Nia Monkote, a great mentor, a man that I credit most of my journey with, was mm. then the assistant headmaster of Presec. So when he saw my distinction, he said, you have to come here. But then I had friends who had gone to sit form in St. Augustine's, mm -hmm. and so I ended up following my friends to St. Augustine's. So ah. that's how St. Augustine's happened. And th these were friends that I went to school in East Legon with growing up. Mm. And you graduated from Nandom with a distinction. Yes. And you came to St. Augustine's. Yes. Tell me about those two mm -hmm. schools and, and, and the experience, experience in Nandom Secondary yeah. School and St. Augustine's. Yeah. 
obviously, which is, uh, we would say, an A-class -A -A or first-class school in the central region. Yes. So what was quite interesting about Nandam Secondary School was that um, everybody that was there was there to escape the tyranny of that environment. Mm. Okay. It was a tough environment, Hamatans, rigid, food awful. But what I saw in these kids were, was a determination to make something out of themselves. Mm. We were in an environment where everybody was motivated. Most of us wore sleepers. There was never a need to compare your stretch jeans to anybody else's. Right. We seem to have been at the same level, you know. A very conducive, quiet, Catholic environment. Kids were working hard, studying with lanterns into the night. There was uniqueness to it, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and, 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 you know, when I look around Ghana today, for a school that started in 1968, it's just amazing how many people we've produced, you know. That's right. Mr. Kumbuo, the former minister yes, for... Benjamin Kumbuo, You yeah. know, um, and, and many, many more. Doctor, uh, the, the chief of staff, uh, I think was works for house and the chief mm -hmm. director. Uh, and many, many others. Doctor um, Ali Samba, Kolibu mm -hmm. Hospital, Doctor Jonathan Yakubo, Doctor Akuma. I mean, for a school 50 years old, it's amazing. Wow. And that was the spirit that drove the place, the determination to escape into a better life, mm. to escape into, to want something, to aspire, to achieve. So we were well driven, you know, people were driven. Um, the food was horrible. <laughs> so when I went to St. Augustine's the first week, uh, I walked into the cafeteria and there was red bread, red beans. I was like, did I just die and go to another planet? <laughs> you know? This is your paradise. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. th that was my free education, right? Mm. The food was horrible. The environment was unforgiving. But we still produce distinctions and we produce people of great honor. And humility, you know, what I saw in St. Augustine was a little different. You mm. know, it was upper class society, people minding their own business, you know. Food was good. I loved the sea. Um, but, you know, my formative years were really driven by both experiences. Absolutely. You know, I've been able to maintain relationships from both ends. But none of them was tough. No, but, I mean, you talk about humility, and I think it's one of the qualities that stands out for you. You don't even have to say it. It resonates you. Um, with you where, wherever you go. And I've had a lot of people, in fact, when we advertised that you were coming on the show this evening, that's one quality that a lot of people kept honing in on, that with all what you have achieved and everything you have run through, even more, you still keep a cool head, very unassuming for the lack of better expression, and, and you're, just, you're just doing and, and making giant strides in silence, not too much noise. What is, you know, look at the experience you went through, um, the Sujia Secondary Education yeah. then, yeah. and what we have now, what do, you think, what do you think is missing in the kind of graduates from senior high school who get into the tertiary institutions? Yeah. Prof. So I think there was a fundamental divide when we transitioned from the A-level system to what we have now. Mm. The A-level in its originality wasn't broken. It just needed some cosmetic you know, tweaking. Mm. We needed to treat it, trick it a little bit. I, I think we went overboard okay right we went overboard and we bring kids into the university system um to study stuff that they should have studied at a levels mm. and now mm. when you have the a level students in your class the was students 10 minutes after the class starts you can tell who came from where mm. so there's a little bit of a struggle so that's one mm. and i think that fundamentally we overemphasize the importance of exams in how we try to mold the next generation. Exams are not the only things that we need to shape these kids. They need continuous assessment. So the challenge that I have with WASI is that we have these kids for four years doing homework, doing quizzes, doing exams. And at the end of this journey, we just test them. And we say, the grades you get from this testing, that snapshot in time, it's what defines your capability to, to succeed hmm. in tertiary education. And there is no basis to it in common sense. It should be cumulative. It should be, the whole experience should shape how you ultimately get into tertiary education. Not the A's, not the B's you get at the end of the exams. I think that is an injustice. Hmm. 
So what happens when you are sick on that day? There is no reference to all the exams, final exams that you, you ace, mm. all the quizzes that you ace. So we need to find a way to blend this nicely together because the continuous assessment is actually a better reflection of achievement than a snapshot in time. The continuous assessment yeah. is a better, better. reflection yeah. of the competence or yeah. of the student. Yeah. Uh, but this is something I've heard you say before. Yeah. Why, why are we still fixated? I mean, I, I know I say, if I say we, I'm talking about the, the, uh, the managers of our education systems so still fixated on exams and forgetting the importance of continuous assessment. Because in senior high school, you will do um, your mid-term mid, mid exams, you will do end-of-term exams, but that's that's just that's just it doesn't does it accumulate into <laughs> your your A's or B's that you yeah. graduate with at at the end of the three years. Yes, you see that's not really helping the situation. No, that's not helpful. And if you actually want to see where the challenges are, um, I've seen a lot of Ghanaians and African students that struggle with standardized exams in the U.S. Hmm. They struggle with those exams. And the reason why they struggle with, it, with that exam is that we are configured to be syllabus students, right? Hmm. So when I was an O-level student, if you go into write general math, you knew that there would be a question on quadratic equations, complete the table, sketch right. it, and pick some points. If you watch standardized exams, you can buy all the books in the marketplace, practice everything. But the day you walk into that exam, they give you questions that requires that you think. Hmm. And our educational system deprives us from thinking. Our educational system deprives, deprives us, us from thinking. thinking. We are only, it's only based on familiarity. So if you see something that you've not seen before, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to tackle it. True. But the educational system is supposed to tool you in such a way that you can think in real time on your feet. Not necessarily something you've seen before. It's not surprising that we, we have <laughs> government will buy past questions for yeah. students to, to learn. Exactly. And that's actually what, what, what you're I'm saying. saying exactly. that, I mean, it, it's yeah. just a recycling of the questions. Exactly. You, you must see something that you're familiar with exactly. to be able to answer. Yeah. And that doesn't bring creativity. <laughs> this that is, doesn't bring creativity. And this you is know, interesting. the other thing that is also quite interesting, interesting, is that we live in denial. Mm. We live in absolute denial when it comes to education. So each time you challenge the status quo, you get feedback like, oh, but look at Kofi Annan, and look at Dr. Victor Lawrence, and look at Dr. Joseph Mensah. They all went through this school system that you are criticizing, and they are very successful. Dr. Osio Asari, you know, member of the National Academy of Engineering in the US. And I said, that is true. But here's where you are missing. Mm. Our educational system is very good at creating exceptions. And exceptions cannot build a nation. You need a critical mass. Exceptionally. So just because a few people escape the trap <laughs> doesn't mean that you have something that is quality. Amazing things you're leaving me with this evening. Our educational system as it stands now yeah. creates exceptional Exception. successes. Yes. And exceptions cannot be the rule. Yeah. You, you want a, a system that will produce mass exactly. scale success yeah. and and in your view so let me put this way what role do you think exams should play mm -hmm. in in the in, in the education system in this country i'll tell I'm you i'm talking about the senior high school yeah. senior high school level yeah. into tertiary you, you know so i will give you a very conservative <laughs> answer <laughs> i think exams really do not have a place in education. Exams my don't have a place. My personal opinion. My personal opinion. And I'll tell you why. As a student, I was a good exam taker, but I hated the whole concept of having to take on exams because I'd rather spend that time learning. I didn't like the pressure mm -hmm. that I have to go and regurgitate what I was learning. I enjoyed trying to figure out what to do with this knowledge that I'm acquiring. And a lot of our students today walk around with a lot of knowledge that they have memorized from books, and yet they don't know what to do with it. Mm. You know, so, I mean, if you, if, you, if you are testing kindergarten kids, instead of taking them into the fields and say, pick a butterfly, 
pick a cockroach, put it under the mi microscope, draw what you see. When I was a biology student, mm. they would say, draw a cockroach and label it. And then we would take the biology book, put a white sheet under it, and trace the cockroach mm. and label it. Now, if you flip that cockroach, we will not be able to label it because that cockroach only has its back pointed at, at oh, us. Now, if, you, if, if, if instead of that, you brought a bowl of formaldehyde with dead cockroaches in it, and each student were to pick their own cockroach, study that cockroach under a microscope, and draw that cockroach, what they see, not what somebody else is seeing, and label it. That's a better learning experience than tracing it in textbook. So we ought to be deliberate about why we need an educational system. That's the fundamental questions we've not answered. What is it that we want to do with our educational system? Why do we need an educational system the way that it is? And I think fundamental answers to that will change our perspectives, because we don't have to do it because other people are doing it. We have to define education within the scope of our reality. We've got to be deliberate yes. and about what we really want the educational system to produce. Yes. I mean, because the chew, poor, pass, and forget yeah. formula that we've been employing yeah. over that period, certainly, yeah. um, in, in your view, and I think it's clear. Yeah. You really mean yeah. have to contend yes. with you on this and, matter. And it's not flexible. Mm -hmm. Our educational system is so regimented, it's so rigid. You know, I have friends who studied music, first degree, yes. and went to medical school. <laughs> and when they walk into the medical ward, they put their ears on a pregnant woman, and they can tell what is happening. They don't need ultrasound. Wow. So somehow they've been able to translate the stuff that excites them into a new profession. I have friends who studied English literature and went to medical school. So, you know, you can't hold a kid accountable for a decision they made when they were 14 years old Absolutely. and say this has to be a millstone on your neck when you are 60. We should have the flexibility for people to change course. I mean, even goods. Mm -hmm. Take a break and turn around, right? Mm. So knowledge evolve, experiences evolve, interests evolve. Mm. At what point in our educational system do we have the flexibility for people to redefine mm. their aspirations and to achieve them? At what point? And, and, and it's so difficult, you know, because then you, you, you are stuck to a particular kind of yeah. knowledge. Yeah. And so translating it into another field mm -hmm. becomes a challenge because yeah. you're not even able to practice it. I, yeah. I saw a joke on, on social media, yeah. X plus Y equals 2X, find X. And people have been looking for the X for only God knows how long yeah. because they don't even understand yeah, the concept. why. And, and yeah. they don't even apply it to their lives. Yeah. So they, they ask the question, so the X plus Y have been learning all the while. Yeah. How, how is it meaningful, meaningful to what to And here's something quite interesting. So when I left St. I left St. Augustine's at lower six. So essentially, I went to the U.S. with my O-levels. Mm. I was a biology student. I went to St. Augustine's. One of the reasons why I went to St. Augustine's was to go to medical school. Mm -hmm. Because that's all I knew then, that if you were a good student, you went to medical school. And then I got head of state award last minute. I was told it was only for engineering. Wow. But here's what is interesting. If I had stayed on and finished set form at St. Augustine's mm -hmm. with physics, chemistry, biology, I would not have been an engineer. engineer. I couldn't have gone to KNUST and be an engineer. Absolutely. But the same government, the same government, gave me a scholarship and said, it's okay for you to take your O-levels to the U.S. and go study engineering. engineering. And the results is there for history to judge. So how many other people were not as lucky as I was? Absolutely. And because they, they, they were caught in this system that, that we find ourselves in. This is food for thought for all of us. In fact, I've been caught in a mode of reflection, trying to think about you know, what, what, what we can do right going forward. But I'm going to go for this quick break. Uh, when we come back, <laughs> a number of things that our guests have said, we would get into tertiary education because he, he has in, invested a lot of his time and effort to try and change the status quo with his own project at the Economic City. We'll, we'll touch on it right after this quick break. Stay with us here on Time with the Captains here on TV3. We're live on TV3 Gun on Facebook. And our virtual guests, uh, that's our audience, will be joining us on Zoom after this quick break. Stay with us.
say, if you want to find the value in a company, look in the balance sheet. But the true value of First National Bank's Corporate and Investment Banking Division isn't apparent on the balance sheet. It's not a number. It's nothing that you can see, hold, or touch. In fact, what defines one of Africa's most successful corporate and investment banks is something completely intangible. Innovation. Going beyond the obvious to generate newer, better solutions to complex business and funding challenges. Solutions that are efficient, appropriately priced, expertly managed for risk. And the results are out there across the African continent. Infrastructure projects that develop our continent. Lending solutions that can help fund expansion or growth by acquisition. IPOs on the security exchange that offer corporates funding from equity capital markets. Corporate banking solutions that optimize the working capital cycle. Improve transactional banking and foreign exchange. Hedging solutions that can manage interest rate risk and foreign exchange risk. Business challenges cannot always be solved at the same level of thinking that created them. It's often necessary to come at them from different perspectives, to overturn conventional wisdom. Innovative solutions require innovative thinking. That's why we employ energetic young graduates looking to make their mark and conservative, seasoned bankers who've seen it all before. Nerdy mathematics geniuses and mature deep thinkers engineers, data scientists, entrepreneurs. This broad range of talent is freed up to perform and do their best. All viewpoints are sought. Intellectual competition is encouraged. Amazing things happen when minds meet in this way and opinions are valued. The best possible solution emerges. It's a powerful mix of individual expertise and collective know-how. Great minds don't think alike. Of course, innovative thinking that can't be packaged into robust financial solutions is of limited use in banking. We enjoyed the backing of the formidable balance sheet of First Rand, one of Africa's largest financial services groups, with offices in Africa, Europe and Asia. We also work across Africa in close partnership with RMB, one of Africa's most successful and awarded corporate and investment banks. Our financial strength is guided by a business philosophy that goes back more than 180 years to the founding of FNB in 1838. It signifies bold thinking, underpinned by financial prudence and solid ethics. We call it responsible innovation, and it coexists comfortably with a strong social and environmental conscience. FNB Corporate and Investment Bank, with a deal footprint in over 35 countries, a financial network spanning multiple continents, a depth of experience built up from countless transactions across multiple industry sectors, and still committed, deeply invested, and thinking up innovative solutions for forward-looking companies. Welcome back to Time with the Captains. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV channel 279, and all across the world on 3news.com. Keep your thoughts coming through. Lots of you sending us uh, messages on uh, Facebook. Nanayao says, good evening, Alfred and the team. Thank you very much for your guest this evening. Challenging conventional wisdom. This one here from Dr. Kwame Asai says, good evening to you and uh, Doc. I want to let him know that if you have people who are thinking the same way and doing the same things and expecting different results, the resistance is Herculean. And I can understand his frustration. Dog, are you frustrated <laughs> about some of the things that No, no, you, I'm, I'm actually not. You, 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 know? you, 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 you face with. No. Well, he says it's not so. Um, this one here is, um, from Nanayao says, Good evening. I want to ask your guest whether, in his view, government should consider abolishing education, sorry, is it abolishing examination, I beg your pardon, at all levels of education in this country from basic, that's he puts into bracket B, C, and then the WASI. If that is the case, what is the most competent alternative to assess 
the level of understanding and assimilation of the students when teachers teach them. Nana Kwame, thank you. You want to answer that before sure, we go Sure, on? absolutely. You know, I'm not saying we should abolish the exam completely. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that, look, um, it's we are, our kids are over-tested. Over-tested? Over-tested. And the emphasis as to who goes up or who stays behind is based on a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. But learning is a cumulative process. Right. So make sure that the continuous assessment, which is what they do when they are not under exams constraints, weighs heavy in the final analysis. Mm. If you test kindergarten kids, what are you really testing? Because these kids are still in, de in their developmental process. Mm -hmm. So we should not be overzealous about what we... It's okay for kids to go the first five years of school and not being tested. Mm. But what happens in the, in, the work of, in, the, in the real world of work? Mm -hmm. You are assessed for your skills True. and your ability to work with other people. Are those what we are testing for? <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> some, some of the people, uh, in fact, our audience is going to be joining us via Zoom in a bit. But on the issue of, I mean, we talked about assessment. Yeah. Another thing that's of equal importance to me is the delivery, yes. the pedagogy. Yeah. In, in the education system. Yeah. What do you find wrong yeah. about how we deliver the knowledge I to think, the people? I, I, I mean, think sometimes students. we speak Hebrew to these kids, you know. We speak Hebrew. Um, you can't teach in the in vacuum. Mm. So I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, my students have a course called Doing Business in Africa and Technology and Society. We are probably the only university that offer those mm. and we send them to the farms send them to the farms we send them to the vegetable farms near the school and we don't have a program in our greek engineering or our greek business but we send them there because we want to put context to what they are doing so wow. they interview the farmers and say hey what are the challenges you are facing here technologically mm. they say well we carry our pumps here every day if we could get solar pumps then we don't need to carry this heavy thing with fuel in it here what other problems do you have? Well, our customers show up at five when they think we don't, because they think we don't have storage facilities and we are forced to sell our produce. Mm. So we put them in wow. the real contest of what these people are doing. Don't teach a cockroach in a picture. Mm. Let them experience it full time. Mm. And it is not that difficult. Mm. Sometimes they say we don't have the equipment. We don't have material. We make more excuses not to do what we can do. So I'll tell you, when I taught at Ashasi University, there was a time when I was teaching materials, engineering, and I just asked my lab tech to go buy clay, three different types of clay, and then find me three reinforcements. So corn skin, tall grass, and the chaff from a bank wine. Mm. And we created molds from it, and we tested the molds. It's equivalent to testing titanium materials that were 100 times more expensive. Absolutely. And you know what happened? And I keep saying this, three of the reports that I received from the students could have gone into a journal. Wow. In addition to that, my colleague that I was teaching the course with was also teaching statistics. So we gave them a single project at the end of the semester. Mm. You do the testing, and then you, do sta you use statistics to analyze it, and you produce one report. And that is real life. Absolutely. If you're a material scientist and you do test, you have to use statistics to address it. So now they understand what statistics is in the real-life context. And you see, and this is clear. You don't, you don't only say it. It's something you do. See, for those of you who want to have an understanding of what Prof has been up to at Academic City, I think a lot of people got to know you when you and your students, in fact, you led the team to produce the low-cost ventilators. Yes. When the first two cases was recorded in Ghana, COVID-19 cases was recorded in Ghana. And I must say, reiterate the congratulations to you Thank and you. the team once again. But how is the practical experiential learning very different at Academic City from the others that, I mean, the tertiary system that we're used to in this country? So, you know, when I meet my tertiary colleagues, they will say, Doc, we like what you're saying, but how do you do that when you have 200 students in your in class? class? And my answer is always, thank God I don't have 200 students in my <laughs> class because I don't know how I would teach what I teach with 200 students in my class. Mm. I think once you get to 40, you max out. You know, you can't have 200 people in a lab at the same time. Even if you divide them into 40, they can't all get into that lab 
on one day. Mm. So I think we just have to look at the infrastructure is also one piece. I think there's a willingness. I don't think anybody goes to teach in the university for the fun of it. I think they go in there because they really want to make an impact. Sure. But we also have to understand the reality of the environment of having too many students to deliver material to. You're mm. going to lose some. Um, and, and that's going to be another problem because with yeah. this pass rate of the of the recent WASI student, yeah. it's expected that the population of students going in tertiary, I mean the public and private tertiary institutions, are actually going to <laughs> be, gonna, be astronomical. Up, you know? And so how do we solve this? <sighs> well, we have a few universities. Yesterday we renamed one in Kumasi, mm -hmm. uh, the University of Winneba campus. Yeah. I was just there last week doing a accreditation audit. And I again, see. one way that I try to help with the change in the system, and I was saying I'm not frustrated, right, mm. is to get involved with these panels and try to help shape some of these programs. Interesting. Uh, how do you go about the, the, the resistance mm -hmm. to the kind of proposals that you make? Mm -hmm. uh, because the, I think the import of the message was mm -hmm. that because people are so used to the, mm -hmm. the way things are done, mm -hmm. accommodating change and yeah. some of the recommendations that you yeah. make or the suggestions you make, it's yeah. a bit difficult for them. How yeah. do you go about yeah. receiving some of these things? So t two things. One, I have the luck of having an experimental institution. Mm -hmm. So I have a platform to deliver to my students some of my aspirations. And the other thing I've done was to sign up with the National Accreditation Board mm -hmm. and say, you know, any time you send a panel to review my programs, I always have a challenge. So maybe I can join, mm. and through that process, I may, be in, I may be able to influence how some of these syllabi are put together and how it's delivered. And so instead of picking up frustration as an easy outlet, I've actually volunteered some of my time, even with my busy schedule as a university president, and I still go around. I did one for Accra Technical, Koforidia, wow. Ho. And, and twice to the Winneba campus in Kumase. So I think we just need to get involved and then we need to have a conversation because sometimes with my fellow panelists, mm. you know, I have to convince them why what we have is okay. You know, so one, for instance, is somebody with a PhD in chemical processes cannot teach automotive engineering and was insisting that we remove the person's name from the faculty list. Mm. And I said, when that engine is running, what do you think is happening in there? Yeah, chemical processes. Absolutely. So part of it is education, part of it is experience. And like I say, you know, I come into academia from industry. I spent 16 years in wow. industry where results matter. True. You just don't sit in the lab. You make products that bring in money. Mm. And, and bringing that experience into the classroom is what helped with us building a ventilator because I've never built a ventilator Absolutely. before. You know, I just said, let's go for it. And we did it. In a minute, I want you to leave the viewers with, with, with something to think about going forward. Mm -hmm. What we can do to make the education system productive much more than it is now. Yes. I think we, we, we have to be deliberate. Mm -hmm. We have to be aspirational in terms of what we want to achieve from our educational system. We have to realign the outcomes of our educational experiment with our aspirations as a nation. They cannot be disjointed. Mm. And what I mean by that is that government should know, our statistics services should know, how many computer scientists we need in the next 20 years. Just like how many doctors we need mm. in the next 20 years. Because then you can put your resources and emphasize the areas that you are interested in. So mm. we need that data and we have to be deliberate about that. Um, I think we have to transition away from procurement, you know, mm. because procurement offers you um, 